You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Science can't, can't answer. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? The place that we live, you know? So I think, I can't remember how many gal- stars there are. I can't even remember how many galaxies there are, but they're in the trillions in terms of the stars. And we happen to be on this little blue dot that's circling around one of those stars. And one can't help but be amazed at how tiny we are when you kind of look at the universe. And when you look at the universe, and scientists do this, of course, all the time, they find that everything has law and order. There's gravity, there's systems, there's orbits of planets. And, uh, and we find the Earth, remarkably, is in what they call the Goldilocks zone. Have you heard about this? So it's not too hot and it's not too cold. It's just right for life to, to exist. And we find ourselves in the privileged position of being on this little blue marble, circling around one of those suns in those trillions of stars in the galaxies. And and in this beautiful blue dot that we're on, we again, we find systems. We find wind systems, water systems. We find the sun and the warmth of the sun. That that, that We find the moon that pulls the waters from from different sides and cleanses the earth, as we as we know, as we as we're in Swansea, we know all about the tides that that causes. And so we're an amazing, absolutely amazing place. And then, of course, within uh, within those different environments that are that are that are there on the earth, we have life. We have different organisms, different creatures, different animals. And it's almost as if again we look at them, and they have different systems. They have uh, their biologies. They have different you know, their blood pumps around their bodies, they have hearts, and they're kind of almost like pre-programmed little, you know, programs that are running off doing their own thing. But perhaps most remarkably, we observe the fact that there are these strange species on the earth called humans, of course, which we are, or most of us anyway, I'm sure. Um, And humans are remarkable because they're different to all of the other animals. Some of the things are nor you know the same like how reproductive systems and the, the way their hearts work and various other things but one remarkable thing about humans is that they can imagine things they can kind of think well if i do this and deduce probably i'll get to this outcome they can dream and they can design a, a future that doesn't quite exist they can imagine what that looks like and then work towards that Humans also have a conscience, like they, they kind of feel bad if they do something wrong or, 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 or noble if they do something they feel is virtuous. They wear clothes, they can hold things, they can create fire. There's loads of things that are different about humans um, that are very different to other animals. Now, I think it's normal for us to ask, being humans, right, and, and sitting in this little blue dot, it's a... It's a reasonable thing for us to take some time out to think about well where did all that come from and and really the big question why is all this complexity and beauty here where does it come from why is it here this is the big question and it's a question i'm going to suggest to you this evening uh, this morning there we are. I used to speak in in the evening it clearly it's a question i'm going to suggest to you science can't really answer for you and you know it's up to you maybe you're happy with the fact that you don't really know why everything's here and where it's come from and there is no purpose and you're happy with that but as a Christadelphian and I'm here to represent the Christadelphians we, we believe that there is something far more magnificent something far more interesting something far more um, meaningful to life other than that it doesn't really matter and no one really knows and we think we've got the answer and the answer we believe is in the bible which we're going to come to by and by now, what I wanted to sort of just kind of highlight in our short time together was two sort of world views. And um, we're going to have a look at these uh, as we go through. The first is the position that we hold as Christadelphians, which is the position of what we call a theist. A theist is a person who believes in the existence of God. We choose to believe it. We believe there's, there's evidence that points to it. 
and we believe it's a very reasonable position to take. And the other position is the, that of the atheist. This is a person who chooses not to believe in the existence of God. Um, they also believe there's reasons and, and uh, why we, they shouldn't believe in the God as well. And these two positions, I'm going to suggest to you, are both positions of faith. One position believes there is a God. The other position believes in something else. They're both positions of faith. And I'll show this to you because it's not often presented in that way uh, to us. What, the way it's presented is that, that the atheist believes in reason and science and provable things and the theist doesn't. Well, I don't think that that's quite correct. I think what you're going to find, hopefully, is that it is very reasonable to believe in the existence of a God. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's absolutely fine. Now, I will be really clear today, this morning, in 20 minutes or so that we've got together, I'm not going to prove to you, I will not be able to prove to you beyond any shadow of a doubt that there is a God. Just, as the, just, a, just the same as a theist would not be able to prove to you that there isn't a God in 20 minutes. What all I can do is show you that it's reasonable, is a reasonable position to show you that there is a God. Now, we, can, we, we hold talks from this platform often on reasons and evidence that there is a God. Bible prophecy, for example, is spoken of often in our community. I would suggest that is evidence that there is a higher being bigger than, than, than us. Um, I think there is reasons to believe that there is um, a being that's created all these things, but we'll show, I'll walk this through as we go through, because as I say, both of these, both of these positions require faith. We can all look at the evidence before us and we can piece that evidence together and choose the way that we will believe. And as I say, I'm gonna be making the case to you this morning that it makes more sense to be a theist, to believe there is a God than to be an atheist. Now, to do that, I want to show you the development of atheistic thought that's happened in our society. Now, I'm going to try and do this at a high level. We've got to, you know, there's a, there's a lot you could say about this, but this concept of being an atheist is actually only quite a new thing, right? Only the last 200 years, it's been born. Before that, most people believed in a god or a, or a, or a deity of some shape or form. And it really stems from this chap, Charles Darwin, great beard, in my view, terrible, terrible view point. But he, he published a book called The Origin of the Species in the 1800s. And he was the first person really to kind of pull together a number of ideas that were bubbling around in science and give a kind of a plausible, if we can put it that way, plausible suggestion as to how all this beauty and this life could have come about without a God. That was his sort of uh, position by naturalistic means. And this is what he sort of said. He said, look, you know, he believed everything, all life came from a common ancestor. And uh, this is from one of his notebooks here. And you can see he's been trying to explain this to somebody. And what he believed is that there was this kind of common being, this first thing, whatever it might be. And it, um, it had, it, it developed and it was reproducing. And then um, something new entered this kind of reproduction. And that spread off and, and kind of formed its own branch of the evolutionary tree, as he called it. And that split off again. And all these kind of split offs took place. New life formed and evolved over time. And he had two kind of main ways of explaining this and two kind of core principles to Darwinism. The first was that as, as an organism changes during its life in order to adapt to its environment, these changes, these natural character, these traits, if you like, were acquired then by its offspring. So the classic example, sometimes still even taught today in schools, shockingly, because um, I'm going to show you it's been completely debunked, is that a giraffe, okay, uh, this is the example, a giraffe um, stretches its neck, okay, in its, and, and over time that giraffe gets a little bit bigger, its neck, and uh, the ones with the bigger neck, as, it, as time goes on, then it would have children. And the idea was that the children would be born with bigger necks. And so as time goes on in the population of giraffe, the, the, the long necks, if we can call them that, would be able to reach the trees. So in times of famine, they get more food than the short necks and sad short necks would die out. And that's the second idea, this idea of natural selection. In other words, within a population, those that are strongest, the survival of the fittest, they'd survive 
And therefore, over millions of years, it was postulated, the, that's how things changed and adapted by different environments. And, and so that's what, that was kind of Darwin's idea. And even today, they still believe, scientists still tell us, and it's supposed to be an, a well-known provable fact, and me, the media take it as, as, as a given that that is exactly how life happened. And so you can see here, they've tried to uh, show that Darwin's tree, how it all branched out, how they've tried to, to map it over millions of years. And that's kind of what, they, what, what the scientists teach us is fact and belief. And so just to sort of summarize Darwin's ideas, the origin of life, he said, didn't really know how that started, but in his, it was, you know, his kind of concept was there was this primordial soup. So the earth was sort of born out of a big bang. There's all this kind of chemicals on the earth. Somehow, we're not quite sure how, but a, kind of a, some life formed magically almost in this kind of soup and the soup came alive and then life developed from there. And, and as time went on through the inheritance of acquired characteristics, natural selection took place, making sure that the, the strong survive and the weak door died out. And everyone says, yeah, that's great. Thank you, job done. But we've got to go a bit deeper because Mr. Darwin has a whole chapter in his book. I don't know if you've ever seen it, The Origin of the Species. I think it's chapter six, where he says problems with the theory right? Problems with my theory. And so he lays out his problems. And he points this out, which is very kind of him, because he actually says this, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numer numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find no such case. So back in Charles Darwin's time, you know, they, they had simple technology back then. They, they knew about cells. They called it the simple cell. They just thought that's what we were made up of. They didn't know anything about um, kind of all the detail. And he says, well, I don't see a reason why my theory couldn't be plausible. I, if you could show me somewhere in nature whereby lots of things had to be present all in one go for them to be functional and they couldn't adapt and develop through billions of times, my theory is going to fall down. So we say, okay, Charlie, Charles, let's see what we can find then. And uh, I'm going to show you something here. So this is the, the, the so-called simple cell. And uh, in Darwin's time, it was just a blob in a micro uh, microscope. But now scientists have zoomed in even more to cells. Now cells, of course, make up all living things, don't they? And this is a, a, a classic cell. Um, and there's thousands, there's these amazing things inside a cell. And it turns out that cell is not simple what, at all. Turns out a cell is basically like a city, all compact into this tiny little, uh, this little thing called the cell. And there's various things. There's the nucleus and the nucleus. Now I'm going to remember this off the top of my head because I can't see my notes. And so everyone's going to, you know, hopefully I get this right. But the nucleus, I, I, as I remember, is kind of like the library of the city. Right. So all the information is in the library, which is the nucleus. And then we have the microchondrii, which I believe is like the, the, the power, uh, the, the power kind of plants within the city. And they generate the, the energy. And then we have the, uh, I know I said this wrong, um, ribozymes. Can someone help me out with that? Is that about right? We're happy with that? Everyone happy with that pronunciation? Great. So we have the, the ribozymes, and I, I can't remember exactly what they do, but I think they, they send off um, bits of proteins around the cell, which help make the cell. And then we have the endoplasmic recti rectilium, which also packages in uh, up these, these proteins and, and sends them around. And remarkably, we have a cell membrane. They don't really know much about this, but this lets certain proteins in and other proteins it keeps out they don't quite know how it knows what to let in and what to let out but anyway the point here i'm trying to make in my very uh, layman's terms is this is not simple this is a complex mechanism and, and what's amazing is that um these your your, your cells or look, most of them anyway are propelled around with this thing called the flagellum and the flag flagellum i think it's called this flagellum is like an outboard motor it has all of these complicated things that, that basically generate power around a motor, around a rotor that rotates or goes the other way, and it can propel these cells around our body, right? And this is incredible, absolutely incredible. 
And here's the interesting thing, because not one of these complex, tiny little pieces of organic mechanics make are any use on their own. They are only useful if they all are assembled and come together at the right time in the right way. Now, there's lots of stuff on, online about this. If you want to look it up, just Google the amazing uh, flagellum and, and you'll see that, that this is something quite remarkable. It's what is the argument we call irreducible complexity. It means you cannot reduce any of these things, uh, otherwise they become useless. Now, one other thing I really wanted to point out, which I think is quite remarkable, is in the cell, in the, in the nucleus, what they did was they, they pulled open this little bit there right in the middle called the chromosome. And inside the chromosome, they did even more work and they found these, these little weird kind of things all twiddled around together and they pulled them out and they found this double helix inside the chromosome. And that turned out to be what they now call DNA. This was discovered in uh, 1953 as a kind of a thing, but they only recently started unpacking it um, over the, I think they just finished it about 20 years ago. It's discovered by James Watson and Francis Crick. Now, what this is, you say, well, okay, Matt, that's lovely. What is DNA? What DNA is, is like an encoded um, kind of piece of information inside every single cell. And what happens is, you, I'm sure you all remember from your school days, is that um, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a kind of baby um, is, is conceived, the, the cell replicates and then it replicates again and then it replicates again. And every time it replicates, it takes with it the whole of the DNA into each of your cells. But some of the DNA bits are switched off and some are switched on. And so no matter if you took a cell from your toenail to your eyelash, the same information will exist in the DNA of each cell, only most of it will be switched off, telling that cell what it needs to be in and amongst the, the, the living thing it's in. I mean, no one quite knows how that works, it just does. And it's remarkable because all the information for life, all the information telling the cell what it needs to be in the grand scheme of where it is, is packed away into this DNA which, as we say, is, is raveled, kind of wrapped up in each of the cells of your body. Now, that is, again, very layman terms for basically saying this is not a simple thing. This is hugely complex. And the most interesting thing is that, therefore, every single cell in your body contains information. So we have in, an information uh, knowledge bank inside these cells packed away. Now. What can happen is you can breed something like a dog, for example, and you can lose some of that information every time it's bred. So you can get a wolf and you can breed it down in theory to a poodle, right? But the poodle, you can never really, re, re, you can't rebreed that back up to a wolf because it's lost information. So you can lose information from the DNA. But the remarkable thing is, is nobody has ever observed new information coming into the DNA system. It's kind of there. They don't know how that information existed in the first place, but it's there. And that code for life, that book for life, if you like, is, is pre-written. Now, remember, just before we proceed, Mr. Mr. Darwin's own challenge to himself. He says, if you can show me something whereby there's a complex organ which existed, which could not have been formed by numerous uh, numerous successive slight modifications, his theory would break down. And I'm going to suggest to you that microbiology does that. The flagellum, the cell, all of those things have to be present at the right time. You can't have a cell without the information bank and the DNA in it because it wouldn't know what to do with itself. You can't have a cell without the power plant in it because otherwise it can't have any energy to do what it needs to do. All of those things need to be together. So this is the argument of irreducible complexity. Now, there's another problem with Mr. Darwin's argument, and that's this. He says life formed in this soup. And um, then as it grew, it, it, this concept of the inheritance of acquired characteristics took place. In other words, you know, the, the giraffe stretches more and then it's kids. It's, it's their necks will be a bit stronger. It turns out since they've discovered DNA, but they realize that this idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics is not true. Basically, if you worked out 
and got really strong muscles, your children wouldn't be born extra strong. It just doesn't happen like that. If, if, you, um, if you happen to, to pluck all of the hairs off of your legs and have kids, surprisingly enough, they still have hair on their legs. So this idea of, of acquired characteristics isn't passed on. The only thing that is passed on is in the DNA, and that is pre-programmed. So what has happened in recent terms, although it's not been widely publicized, is that this idea is debunked. And so a new idea has to take place. And that idea is the idea of what they call mutation. And this is actually known as neo-Darwinism. It's a new form of Darwinism with a new set of doctrines because the old lot's been debunked. But of course, they couldn't go back to the idea of theism. Oh, no. We've got to find somewhere else. So they're scrambling around now. We've got to find new, something else. They call it mutation. And so you can see this is not just me saying this. Researchers build the world's largest evolutionary tree and conclude that species arise because of chance mutations, not natural selection. So this is the new theory. Life forms in a, in a soup um, by chance accident uh, based on radiation, the environment around it. The genetic code kind of is is, is manipulated somehow called a mutation and then natural selection works on, on that. And then we have varied forms of life. Now, I would just point out that both theists and atheists have no problem with the concept of natural selection. If we took all the cars on the street outside and we said, we're going to naturally select all the red cars, we're going to blow up all the other cars, we're going to ditch them, we'd have all the red cars left. And so in na natural circumstances, I don't think um, anyone reasonable would say, well, that, that's a silly idea. The survival of the, the fittest makes sense um, in, their natural, in their natural setting. But where we kind of have some science friction, if you like, is in this idea of the mutation and the life forming from primordial soup. You know, this idea that, that by accident, somehow a lightning bolt strikes some chemicals and suddenly a cell with the complexities that we've seen all suddenly assembles with all the proteins in place and then life can begin is just is a is, is a matter of faith. If you believe that that happened. And then also it turns out that you also have a lot of have to have a lot of faith in this concept of mutation, because there's a massive problem with mutation in that there's no evidence of new information being added to the genome because of a mutation. Basically, there's a scrambling of genetic information that already exists that can take place. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned some bits are switched on and switched off. Sometimes it switches some stuff on. Most of the time, though, with most observable mutations, they're usually harmful or neutral, and they are rarely considered beneficial at all. So you have to have a huge, they've never observed new information, DNA, kind of forming, ever. It's kind of always scrambled or reassembled from what's already there. And no one's ever kind of gone, come along, seen a lightning bolt strike a pond, and suddenly there's these, these new strands of DNA that no one's ever seen before take place. But that's what you're being asked to believe if you take on the scientific explanations for what happened without a god. So my point here, in a nutshell, just to sort of round things off, is you've got to have a lot of faith. You've got to have a lot of faith in mutation, unproven. You've got to have a lot of faith in this idea of life forming from a soup. Again, requires a lot of faith. Now, I just want to put one argument of logic towards you. Let's say I, I took you to Waterstones in Swansea, right? And we're there in Waterstones, and we're looking at, at a pile of books. And I say to you, right, OK, what, are, what, do you, what do you think? Who, how do you think they came there? You would say, well, look, somebody wrote them on a computer, maybe, and then somebody printed them. And then they were bound and they were assembled and they're all there. Now, DNA, in one DNA cell, I think they, they, they were saying that in, in one DNA strand, there's like a thousand books of about 500 pages each. And I'd say to you, well, if you logically look at that and you say, look, OK, Matt, these books here, clearly show there's information intelligence. No one would walk into Waterstones and go, oh, that's a surprise, isn't it? Look at that, that's remarkable how all these books turned up out of absolutely nothing. And look, isn't it amazing that all the page numbers are listed and all of the things make sense and they're all kind of all in place. That's amazing that that could have happened by chance. Like nobody says that because logic would tell you that the order and the system 
that created these books comes from intelligence. And that's the argument I want to put to you today, that all of the, the things that these scientists are, point, uh, are finding out more and more is that behind it, there, are, there are, is intelligence. And that's this idea of the book of life is exactly how scientists explained away the genome, this, this idea of the DNA, the book of life, they call it. And that's what they say, but they, they come across the book of life packed away in a cell and they say, wow, isn't that amazing? It happened by chance. They go to Waterstones and they say, oh, that's clearly designed. The logic doesn't add up. I'd say to you, it's very reasonable that we would conclude that an intelligent designer has created this book of life in DNA because of the complexity of it, because of the marvel of it. And I, I, as you probably could tell, by the way, I very poorly trans, uh, articulated the parts of the simple cell. Um, I'm not a microbiologist, but I am a designer. And um, I can tell you that there's always purpose behind something that's designed and ordered and considered. It's just the way it is. I mean, you don't do all of that unless there's a reason behind it. And the Bible does give us a reason. I'm just going to come on to that one second. I just want to make that point. That if you think about all of that stuff that I've showed you, and I've just scratched the surface of the complexity, I suggest to you, it makes more sense to believe in a God than not a God when it comes to looking at the, the order and the design and the construction of the DNA and the cells. So I just want to finally wrap up by introducing you, and I'm sure you're familiar if you come to these lectures, but just at a high level to the God of the Bible. Because the Bible has an explanation. The Bible says to us, look, 6,000 years ago, the Bible calls this the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth, and he creates all living things that are on this planet. And interestingly, the Bible explains that, that the earth brought forth the living creature, and here's an interesting biblical expression, after his kind. And so we believe that there are, there are different kinds, different kinds of dogs, different kinds of fish, different kinds of plants, different kinds of humans. We believe in variation. We, we're happy with natural selection. We're happy with small adaptation. But where the Bible departs is, is in this concept that everything evolved, like whole different species evolved, like from a hamster to a whale, right? We just think that that's nonsense because the Bible designed different things after his kind. And observable science backs up that that is the case. And we read in, in the Psalms, for example, that there's a purpose behind this, that this design of the wonder of creation in the universe, it actually declares the fact that there is a God. It declares the glory of God and shows his handiwork. If you look at it and you can say, look, there's intelligence there, then surely it's not difficult for you to think that there's a God outside of what we've got, uh, of what we know. And it says here, the testimony of the Lord in the Bible is sure, making the simple wise, or wise the simple. And the other thing that it, the Bible tells us is that God has a purpose. He's created the heavens and the earth, and he's done that, not in vain, not, not for a waste of time. Yes, he's done it to declare his glory, but he's done it so that it can be inhabited. So God's got a purpose for the earth other than uh, just setting it off in motion. Now, what is that purpose? Well, I'm going to have to summarize this due to time. But as we say, the Bible explains that God created all life on this planet about 6,000 years ago, and that he gives a special law to the humans, the first humans that he created, Adam and Eve, and that they break this law, and that, that then set about a, a series of events where they became mortal. In other words, they could die. And had this kind of inbuilt bias to sin against God in their minds. And so this mortality, the Bible tells us, was inherited by the rest of the human race with this rebellious nature that it intertwined with it. But the good news is that God, in his mercy, designed a way of salvation from that kind of route to death. And he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to show forth powerful principles to those that would believe. He sent his son in the same, uh, with the same problem as the rest of humanity. He had, he had this bias to sin. He was tempted in all points, but he didn't sin. He was mortal like we are. And he died on the cross 2,000 years ago to show that it was right. God's, God's judgment on humanity was right. Even without 
breaking the law just by being human, just by inheriting that, it was right that, that we die. But because Christ did no sin, we read in the Bible that God raised him from the dead and rewarded him with eternal life. And since then, and, and even before then, God has been calling people out of the general population of humanity to the knowledge of this through his gospel. And if they believe it and they are baptized, the Bible says that they can share, share in Christ's reward, which is to be free from mortality and sin and find a place in the coming kingdom of God on the earth. And so that's what we believe as Christadelphians. There's much more detail we could go into, you know, the kingdom being the restored kingdom of Israel, for example, and various other things. But on a, in a nutshell, at a high level, that's what we believe. And so we want to encourage you to, to keep coming along, to discover more about the God of the Bible and the gospel and the great hope of salvation in the Bible. Because as we've said already, it does really indeed make more sense to believe in a God than to believe that all this stuff kind of, came out of a primordial soup billions and billions of years ago. So thank you very much. I hope you found... Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen